Hello and welcome to the MOOC on Optical Communications. In this module, we will discuss optical amplifiers. These components or devices if you would call them, they are very important in a modern optical communication system. Now, the reason why an optical amplifier is important is just as why an electrical amplifier is important when you are looking at communication systems. Because amplifiers allow you to amplify the signal. So, typically signals which are at the receiving end. So, at the transmitting end when you transmit a modulated information on the carrier and then send it out to the receiver, the signals are quite strong. So, if you were if, if you were to look at the energy in the sidebands for example, in a double sideband modulation, then the energy would be significant at there as does the carrier energy as well. However, as this double sideband suppressed carrier maybe for example, passes through the atmospheric channel because of the losses and because of the noises that get accumulated especially at the receiver end, what will happen is right at the receiver side, if you want to look at the energy, the energy would have been very small. A very similar thing happens when you take the optical carrier in the form of a laser and then modulate this laser in order to impress your data onto that. And then this modulated carrier travels through the optical fiber and fiber introduces dispersion as well as loss. So, loss is of course important because it basically starts to reduce the signal amplitude or equivalently the optical power. So, it might come to a situation where the optical power that is received will be so small that it would essentially be buried inside the noise that you are going to look at. So, you, you are in uh, from the noise from which you are trying to extract the signal. We normally quantify how much the signal you know is powerful compared to the noise by defining a quantity called a signal to noise ratio. So, you want at the receiver a very high signal to noise ratio, you want it because your signal which is very small in amplitude, if it is very small in amplitude, then it is almost impossible for us to distinguish the signal from the noise if the signal to noise ratio is very small. Now, one can of course, mitigate this problem without the use of an optical amplifier. How would we do that? Suppose you have a carrier, so let us say this is there at your transmitter end, you modulate it, you send the information. Okay. So, let us say your fiber has a certain length and then after a certain after that particular length, the optical power would have reduced to so much that you cannot detect it. That is your APDs or the photodiodes will have a detectivity which uh, detectivity or the sensitivity below which the signal power would fall if the length of the fiber is large. So, if you, if you do not want this length of the fiber, so if you do not want the signal to be lost in this uh, you know in this process and hence you, you want to recover the signal, you can simply reduce the length of the fiber. Okay. So, reduce the length of the fiber, detect the signal, amplify it okay. and then maybe if you want to clean up the signal, you can also clean up the signal. Maybe the signal is also suffering from some chromatic dispersion. So, the bit boundaries have slightly enlarged, so you can actually reshape the signal. So, you can receive the signal. Re, you know, regenerate the signal, reshape the signal, you do all that okay, and then send it on to the next span. Okay. Notice here what has happened, you have not used an amplifier. So, whatever that you have to work with, you have to work with very possibly very low uh, optical powers and moreover the available or the you know, the uh, span length that you are looking at will have to be limited because if I increase the span length that is length between the regenerator, repeater and the transmitter or between two regenerative repeaters if you are in the mid span of the link, then the distance between this span actually reduces. You do not want this because reducing the distance means that you have to put in more and more regenerators. The number of regenerators simply start increasing as the as uh, if you do not have an amplifier and you have to you have to choose and you choose to work with this low amplitude or low power scenario. Okay. So, it is not advisable from the cost point of view. Moreover, if you do not have am, you know enough amplitude or enough optical power, it is not just you cannot you know regenerate the signal. You might also be suffering from other problems. For example, if you have multiple wavelength signals which you have multiplexed okay, and then you have transmitted. So, at the transmitter there is sufficient power, but at the receiver in order to regenerate the signal, you have to first separately take each signal out through a each wavelength out through a wavelength demultiplexer. And once you have taken them through the demultiplexer, then you have to separately put a regenerative repeater. Okay. So, you, you see that if you do not have an amplifier, the length before which you have to 
uh, you know regenerate becomes very small. If you had an amplifier then you can go long distances without really amplifying okay, or without really doing anything and once the signal level falls right at the end of the first span you can simply amplify the signal back to a desired level that you want. And it is always nice to work with signals at this level you know where there is comfortable optical power so that the further parts of the communication link are satisfactorily working. So, what you need is an optical amplifier and we are specifying something like optical amplifier. What is the difference between an optical amplifier and electrical amplifier? Except that they work at two different wavelengths, in theory there is no difference between an electrical amplifier and an optical amplifier. However, for optical communication systems the development of optical amplifiers was a very very significant step. Uh, in fact, before the optical amplifiers the systems would normally look like this. So, you have a transmitter here and from the transmitter you launch onto the fiber it would propagate. Now, notice there was no optical amplifier. So, what you had to do was you had to put a photo detector right. So, you had to put a photo detector from the photo detector receives. Once you have the photo detector you convert from optical signals over here to the electrical signals onto the photo detector. Then you would amplify regenerate and then amplify regenerate and reshape ok. So, you would do all these processes in the electrical domain because it was kind of easier to develop or the technology for microwave amplifiers or electrical amplifiers was very mature in the early 80s you know because of the developments in the microwave technology. So, you could convert from optical to electrical and do all the processing in the electrical side and then put one more optical transmitter or an optical modulator. So, let us just put an optical modulator and then transmit once more ok. So, this block which you can you know encapsulate from the receiver side on to the modulator side would perform optical to electrical conversion, amplification and other processes you know clean up the signal and again from electrical to optical signal back. So, you have of course, at this point an optical signal and at this point an optical signal, but in between there has been a bottleneck. Why is there a bottleneck? Because your optical to electrical conversion is a slow process depends on the photodiode and the associated circuits and whatever the amplification, regeneration, reshape that you have to do, you will have to do that in the electrical domain and it is cost ineffective because you have to after doing the electrical signal, after getting a reasonably clean electrical signal, you then have to remodulate the optical carrier. So, of course, you would also require a laser diode at this point. So, you have to you see that at every span you have to put a laser diode, you have to put a modulator, you have to put all these things. So, clearly giving us a problem in terms of cost, giving us a problem in terms of speed or the distance between the spans right. So, the distance was also a major factor because you could not go far too long because if you went far too long then you see that the optical power would have dropped considerably over here. So, the lesson out here is that around 80s people realize that if they have to you know increase the speed of operation. So, at that time the, the optical speeds was not very high ok. However, if they the, the demand for speed was always there and if you wanted to go to a larger speed then it was necessary to circumvent this bottleneck ok. So, optical to electrical and electrical back to optical is something that we would not want to have it because it will increase cost, it will decrease speed and it will also limit the distance. So, what is the solution? So, interestingly two kinds of solutions came up, one was called as semiconductor optical amplifier ok. So, these are for short known as SOAs ok and these work essentially on the principle of very similar to a principle of a semiconductor laser. In fact, we will very shortly see the relationship between a laser and an amplifier. These semiconductor optical amplifiers was made out of the same materials as the semiconductor lasers more or less they were made of the materials as the semiconductor lasers and they were excellent in amplifying signals optically. So, what is the significant difference over here? You have an optical signal coming from a transmitter passing through the fiber. So, you have a signal that is completely optical and then if you give this one to a semiconductor optical amplifier what you would get would be an amplified optical signal ok and this amplified optical signal you would get in the optical domain itself. So, there is no conversion 
of optical to electrical and back from electrical to optical. So, this in principle would have been a very nice solution and in fact, it was proposed as a nice solution except that it did not work very well okay, for various reasons that we will comment on later. But if you had this semiconductor optical amplifier, you give an optical input and what you get would be an amplified optical output. So, no electrical to optical or optical to electrical and electrical to optical conversion and therefore, the speed could be increased tremendously. As far as the cost is concerned, again the cost, well you know in this case it is just doing the purpose of an amplifier. If you want to clean up your signals, you still have to do something else onto that one. But if you clean up is what not what you are looking for, then this would also reduce the cost. Moreover, you can now increase the distance between the transmitter and the point where you put in the amplifier because at that point you have still a little bit of an optical power which can then be amplified. So, if you were to follow up on how the optical power would go, let us say you launch a certain power PTX over here. Okay, So, this is the launch power, maybe you could call this as P in, but I just arbitrarily call this as PTX because of the fiber there is a linear attenuation up there, correct? So, the power basically goes down, I am plotting all the powers in the dB scale and what is the loss here? Alpha f into L. So, the slope of this one would be alpha f. At this point of course, the power that you are receiving will be Ptx minus alpha L all measured in terms of dBm. How many milliwatts above this particular thing would exist? Now, this one can be amplified Okay, so, let us say at this point we put in a semiconductor optical amplifier of an appropriate gain so that I can bring back the optical power to what it was originally to begin with. Okay, so, at the transmitter side you have PTX and because of an SOA which has applied a gain G, now the total power has gone back to PTX. Okay. If you have the next span launched, the power would again reduce. At this point you would put one more amplifier to pull the power back onto PTX and that is how you would able to transmit the optical signals. If the optical amplifier was not there, then the launch PTX would have to be stopped much before because if you had let it go all the way here, the sensitivity or the detectivity of the APD or the optical receiver would not be sufficient. So, you have to interrupt the process right before here and then do an optical to electrical conversion back from electrical to optical conversion and then pull up the power. Okay. So, you can see very well that whereas you know this is not exactly to the scale, but you can clearly see that you would require multiple such optical to electrical and electrical to optical elements before you would be able to go to the same span length as something that an optical amplifier would provide. This distance before you put in the first repeater or you distance before you put the first regenerator is called as a span or sometimes called as a repeater less span. So, what would be that span or what would be the length of the fiber before you put in the first repeater. So, this is something that an optical amplifier would provide an advantage. Okay. Now, semiconductor optical amplifiers was one possible solution, but however, it emerged that there was one more solution which was much more robust than the semiconductor optical amplifiers and it possessed a lot of other advantages that SOAs did not possess. Okay. This amplifier was actually made from a fiber material itself. So, it was actually made from a fiber and in the regular silica fiber, you took what are called as this erbium ions. Okay. These are, these belong to what is called as a rare earth material or these are in the periodic table, they are in the rare earth column. So, these erbium ions were doped onto silica fiber. So, silica was the host here and erbium ions were the ones that were being doped. The symbol for erbium is an erbium 3 plus, these are the ions that you are actually looking at. So, which means that they do come with some electric field okay? So or they will at least perturb the electric field of the silica host changing the overall energy levels. Okay? So, these amplifiers which were made of what are called as erbium doped fibers, they became very, very popular. In fact, these are the reasons why the WDM era simply took off. So, what is it that erbium doped fiber amplifiers had that SOAs lacked? Well, erbium doped fiber amplifiers was very efficient fiber coupled amplifier. Okay. So, you did not have to go from a fiber input which was coming from the transmission fiber, convert that fiber into a free space version in order to launch onto the 
optical amplifier, semiconductor optical amplifier because semiconductor optical amplifier is a waveguide. So, you have a fiber and you have a waveguide. So, from fiber to waveguide if you want to couple there are going to be losses. So, this fiber coupled amplifier or this RBM doped fiber amplifier did not have a, such a problem. Although there is a different kind of a problem, this problem is largely mitigated because your input is fiber and the amplifier material is also in the fiber domain. Okay. So, it was very efficient fiber coupled device and more importantly it could amplify multiple wavelengths simultaneously. Okay. Although semiconductor optical amplifier can also do this multiple wavelength amplification, it does suffer from certain problems. Okay. It mainly suffers from the problem of crosstalk and it also suffers from what is called as the gain burning you know. So, the uh, uh, we will we'll talk about that one slightly later. Okay. But RBM doped fiber amplifiers could actually amplify multiple wavelengths simultaneously. The gain of these wavelengths were not always the same, okay, but that was a problem that was solved very quickly after the RBM doped fibers were introduced. So, before that the point to note here is that they were able to amplify all these wavelengths in the so called C band simultaneously thus giving rise to no requirement of a demultiplexing and then separately amplifying everything. Okay. So, you just put one uh, you know uh, so whatever the incoming fiber that is there you just couple it to the RBM doped fiber pump the RBM doped fiber and what you get is an amplified signal all wavelengths are amplified simultaneously okay. more or less they are all amplified simultaneously. Moreover, RBM doped fiber amplifiers were more or less insensitive to polarization changes of the input they were also insensitive more or less to the uh, fluctuations in the pump power. Whereas, these two qualities were completely opposite in the semiconductor optical amplifiers. So, what we will do here would be to first talk about the RBM doped fiber amplifiers in the next few minutes and then talk about the remaining amplifiers in the next module. Okay. So, let us begin by looking at what an RBM doped fiber amplifier is and how it would amplify the signals. We will not go into a too detailed theory at this point because although the actual working of an RBM doped fiber amplifier is quite complicated and there are good number of textbooks available for you to fill up that knowledge. From the big picture perspective an RBM doped fiber amplifier or a semiconductor optical amplifier both operate on the principle of stimulated and spontaneous emission. If you recall what the stimulated and spontaneous emissions were if you remember you had materials which had certain energy levels. So, let us say this material had an energy level E 1, energy level E 2 and an energy level E 3. So, I am showing three energy levels because that is what is typically found in a RBM doped fiber. So, to these energy levels you want to pick two of those energy levels and create a population inversion. This of course, being the ground state will be the first natural part of the two level system and we have to choose between E 2 and E 3. It turns out that if you choose to pump this RBM doped fiber okay, with a 980 nanometer pump diode. Okay, so, this has to be a separate one this is a pump diode. So, if you were to choose to pump then all the atoms that are there in the ground level or the ions that are there in the ground level would absorb the photons at 980 nanometer and jump up to level E 3. Okay. From this level they will very quickly within about 1 to 2 microsecond drop down to level E 2. So, there is some sort of an indirect pumping going on. So, you take an erbium doped fiber and then you send in the 980 nanometer photon through a pump photodiode a uh, pump uh, laser diode. This would then excite all the atoms from level 1 to level 3 wherein they will relax they would not emit anything they will simply relax in what is called as non radiative decay. Radiative means they will emit some radiation non radiative decay means they will not emit any radiation. So, they will non radiatively decay down to the level 2 and start increasing the population of level 2 ions. Eventually once you have a signal input. So, let us call this as the signal input or maybe this is my signal input. Then this signal input would also be in terms of photons these photons are then absorbed by the ions that are there in the second level and then they will drop down to the ground level emitting a photon. Okay. The larger the number of input photons that you send to a certain extent the larger would be the number of stimulated emission photons. Okay. So, what would be the result of that the signal would then be amplified. So, the signal power would be larger 
than whatever the signal that went in. In this case, the signal is actually a time domain or a time varying waveform which is coming in in the 1550 nanometer band. So, RBM doped fibers amplifiers are widely used for C band amplification. Okay. C band is around 1520 to 1600 nanometer. So, in this band your entire DWDM technology is more or less located in this band and the RBM door fiber amplifiers can almost simultaneously amplify every wavelength out in this particular case. Now, you know from our discussion on a laser that there are three components to a laser. So, there is actually an amplifier in between. This amplifier is what we called as a active medium. Active medium is the one wherein we can create a population inversion. So, RBM doped fibers are you know equivalent to an amplifier because or equivalent to an active medium because when you pump this RBM ions, these ions will jump through the indirect process and create a population inversion between the energy levels E2 and E1. Okay. So, you have an amplifier or an active medium which is anyway there. The second ingredient of this was that you put this amplifier inside a certain cavity. Why would you put them inside a certain cavity such as a fabri perot cavity in this case? Because you want to provide optical feedback. right? So, you want to provide an op optical feedback and of course, a laser does not really take in any external signals. It relies on the process of spontaneous emission to start the process, but once the spontaneous emission starts, okay, because you have created population inversion, each spontaneously emitted photon would then induce a stimulated emission and the stimulated emission would further induce stimulated emission because they are all getting reflected or they are all confined by this cavity. So, such a thing was essentially what you had for a laser. Now, all you have to do is you take the same device, okay, of course, here there was a pump Remember pump was necessary to create a population inversion. Okay. So, without you creating a population inversion stimulated emission cannot take place and whatever the emission that you are going to get will be spontaneous emission and it would not laze. To this laser what you now do is you simply remove this feedback mechanism or at least at any rate make this feedback mechanism to be a very very weak one. Okay. So, this is my attempt at drawing a very weak feedback mechanism. So, I have converted a laser into an optical amplifier by removing the optical feedback. So, I am removing the optical feedback or I am at least very very minimalistic optical feedback. I have essentially minimized any optical feedback. Okay. Instead, stimulated emission is brought about by supplying an external input signal. So, I supply an external input signal so that I get an amplified external output voltage. Okay. So, what I have wrote I have written over here is actually P out and the gain can be written in terms of P out and P in as how much optical power that you obtained at the output compared to what optical power you gave at a certain pump current or a pump value. Okay. So, this same idea is for both SOS as well as for EDFS. In EDFA, this is the energy level that you are looking at. Okay. Of course, we have also seen that these energy levels are not really energy levels. They actually form a certain band. There is a quasi continuous discrete levels. They are formed because of the, you know, the closely spaced atoms in a dense solid medium as well as in this particular case, you see that you have a quasi continuous discrete levels and this quasi continuous discrete levels happen simply because each RBM ion that is introduced will cause the splitting of the energy level. So, this splitting is called a stark splitting and to properly appreciate the stark splitting one has to look at quantum mechanics. We are certainly not going to do that, but just take it on the f uh, faith that if you have energy levels, these are not going to be discrete energy levels, but they are going to be certain bands around that discrete energy levels. In fact, band is something that is very, very important. Okay. If you had a discrete energy level, an active medium with just lines E1 and E2. So, I am neglecting E3 because you can you are only looking at population inversion between E2 and E1. If you had just two lines, then there was only one particular wavelength which this could have amplified. Okay. So, if you have such an amplifier, you know if you make such an hypothetical amplifier over here and then you come in with a certain broadband signal. So, this is as a function of wavelength, you come in with certain broadband input signal, then what you would have obtained is only one amp 
wavelength that is getting amplified. So, you do not want really to happen this, you do not want this to happen. What you want is if you have a band of frequencies, you know, that is over which the gain can take place, such is something that happens because of the star splitting of the energy bands. Then, when you come in with multiple wavelengths, then multiple wavelengths can be amplified. So, this is what you would actually observe in an actual erbium doped fiber and this bandwidth of the erbium doped fiber is essentially determined by what is the width of this quasi continuous band of energy levels that would be possible when you have a erbium ion doped into the fiber. Okay. So, this is how an erbium doped fiber would work except that I would like to mention it is not just necessary to have a 980 nanometer pumping, it is possible to actually have another type of pumping. Here this pump goes into a 1480 nanometer, okay, which means that you can take a 1480 nanometer laser and then pump it so that the atoms do not go to the energy level E3 and then dk, they will directly go to the energy level E2. However, this is not usually done for communication applications because 980 nanometer pump is very low power case or essentially efficient process. So, for the same pump power, the population inversion that is created with 980 nanometer is much higher compared to the 1480 nanometer. There is however, the problem with 980 nanometer is that its output power is low as well as a high power 980 nanometer is actually quite difficult to achieve. That is to say, high power output is quite difficult to achieve. Moreover, this requires a WDM pump coupler. Okay. A pump coupler is a device which actually works something like this. So, you have a 1550 nanometer which is a signal input port and you have a 980 nanometer coming from a pump diode and this pump coupler actually couples these two very different wavelengths. Okay. So, these are called as pump couplers okay. and then you can give this one to the erbium doped fibers for amplification purposes. So, this is your erbium doped fiber. Okay. So, this process is while very efficient and therefore, widely used in communication purposes, 1480 nanometer actually has its use in high power lasers. Okay. So, when you want a high power laser to be fabricated using a fiber, erbium doped fiber, then you use a 1480 nanometer pump. You also use this 1480 nanometer pump because you do not require a WDM coupler or the pump coupler is not required because the same single mode fibers can be used. So, you can just take the erbium doped fiber, you can just connect it to using an ordinary coupler which is very cheap compared to a WDM pump coupler. Okay. And most importantly, this can be remotely located. So, you can actually put this 1480 nanometer coupler at the transmitter side. Okay. So, you have a 1480 nanometer pump and this pump co-propagates along the signal. Okay. So, no special pump you know coupler is required, it is an ordinary coupler that is sufficient and it would if you put in an erbium doped fiber here, then this would nicely amplify this particular input. Okay. But amplify this signal input in order to generate the amplified signal output. Okay. So, this is all about erbium doped fiber amplifier. We are going to stop discussing this one and then come back to the other aspects of erbium doped fiber in the next module. Thank you very much.